Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for January 22nd through 28th, 2024. This is covering 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 15. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Uh Uh-oh, Scriptures, I am so excited to learn from you. It's so great to see you here. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 42 minutes, 4 seconds. Wow, compared to the other ones, this is a long one. But what would it be daily? Six minutes even. Yeah, that's not a problem. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about it all together. But right before we get started, remember that a link to a PDF of all our quotes and graphics, as well as links from the episode, can be found in the description section below the YouTube video. We hope these will help you in your study. Also, there is an audio-only version of this podcast that is available wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Right! One of the most amazing visions was discussed last week, Lehi's vision of the tree. Today, we get to explore what happens when Nephi prays to find out more. Remember that his faith had grown a lot lately. His heart was softened by the Lord when he was commanded to follow his father from Jerusalem. He declared, I will go and do, when asked to return, and was diligently trying to get the plates. He overcame his doubts with faith, even in the most challenging times, like when he was commanded to take Laban's life. So, when he asks the Lord to see the vision his father saw, he was prepared for an answer. As we explore Nephi's experience, you might notice it as different from Lehi's in a few important ways. Lehi is seeing the vision through the lens of a worried, fearful parent, It begins in a dark and dreary waste, whereas Nephi's begins on a mountaintop. A man in a white robe leads Lehi for hours in this dismal wilderness until Lehi prays for mercy. Nephi's vision has a much more positive tone, as we will see. For it came to pass, after I had desired to know the things that my father had seen, and believing that the Lord was able to make them known unto me. As I sat pondering in mine heart, I was caught away in the Spirit of the Lord, yea, into an exceedingly high mountain, which I had never before seen, and upon which I never had before set my foot. Behold, what desirest thou? I desired to behold the things which my father saw. Believest thou that thy father saw the tree of which he hath spoken? Yea, thou knowest that I believe all the words of my Father. Hosanna to the Lord, the Most High God, for he is God over all the earth, yea, even above all. And blessed art thou, Nephi, because thou believest in the Son of the Most High God, wherefore thou shalt behold the things which thou hast desired. And behold, this thing shall be given unto thee for a sign, that after thou hast beheld the tree which bore the fruit which thy father tasted, Thou shalt also behold a man descending out of heaven, and him shall ye witness. And after ye have witnessed him, ye shall bear record that it is the Son of God. Look. And I looked and beheld a tree, and it was like unto the tree which my father had seen, and the beauty thereof was far beyond, yea, exceeding of all beauty. And the whiteness thereof did exceed the whiteness of the driven snow. I behold that thou hast shown unto me the tree which is precious above all. What desirest thou? To know the interpretation thereof. Look. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the great city Jerusalem and also other cities. And I beheld the city of Nazareth. And in the city of Nazareth I beheld a virgin, and she was exceedingly fair and white. Nephi, what beholdest thou? a virgin most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. Knowest thou the condescension of God? I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. 
Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. And it came to pass that I beheld that she was carried away in the spirit. Look. And I looked and beheld the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. Behold the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? Yea, it is the love of God, which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore it is the most desirable above all things. Yea, and the most joyous to the soul. Look. And I looked, and I beheld the Son of God, going forth among the children of men. And I saw many fall down at his feet and worship him. And it came to pass that I beheld that the rod of iron, which my father had seen, was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living waters, or the tree of life, which waters are a representation of the love of God. And I also beheld that the tree of life was a representation of the love of God. Look, and behold the condescension of God. And I looked and beheld the Redeemer of the world, of whom my father had spoken. And I also beheld the prophet who should prepare the way before him. And the Lamb of God went forth and was baptized of him. And after he was baptized, I beheld the heavens open, and the Holy Ghost come down out of heaven and abide upon him in the form of a dove. And I beheld that he went forth ministering unto the people in power and great glory. And the multitudes were gathered together to hear him. And I beheld that they cast him out from among them. And I also beheld twelve others following him. And it came to pass that they were carried away in the spirit from before my face. And I saw them not. Look. And I looked and beheld the heavens open again. And I saw angels descending upon the children of men. And they did minister unto them. Look. And I looked and I beheld the Lamb of God going forth among the children of men. And I beheld multitudes of people who were sick and who were afflicted with all manner of diseases and with devils and unclean spirits. And the angel spake and showed all these things unto me. And they were healed by the power of the Lamb of God. And the devils and the unclean spirits were cast out. Look. And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God that he was taken by the people, yea, the Son of the everlasting God, was judged of the world, and I saw and bear record. And I, Nephi, saw that he was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. And after he was slain, I saw the multitudes of the earth, that they were gathered together to fight against the apostles of the Lamb. For thus were the twelve called by the angel of the Lord. And the multitude of the earth was gathered together. And I beheld that they were in a large and spacious building, like unto the building which my father saw. Behold the world and the wisdom thereof. Yea, behold, the house of Israel hath gathered together to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And it came to pass that I saw and bear record that the great and spacious building was the pride of the world. And it fell and the fall thereof was exceedingly great. Thus shall be the destruction of all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people that shall fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. I think Robert Millet said it best when he called Nephi's vision a literary masterpiece and a doctrinal gem. Hey, we like gems. Yeah, we do. Nephi's vision could be broken down into a four-act play. Act 1 would be contained in 1 Nephi chapter 11, the one we just talked about. This covers Christ's earthly ministry. In Act 2, the Nephites and Lamanites are in the land of promise. We see things going well and the eventual apostasy. That's in chapter 12. Act 3 the Gentiles and the house of Israel in America, the bringing of the Bible to a free land in America, and the beginning of the restoration of the gospel. In Act 4, the period immediately preceding Christ's second coming, we see the church of the Lamb of God and the church of the devil. This is chapter 14. 
For more information on this, Amy Easton Flake wrote an article called Lehi's Dream as a Template for Understanding Each Act of Nephi's Vision in a collection called The Things Which My Father Saw, Approaches to Lehi's Dream and Nephi's Vision from a Sperry Symposium. We'll include a link in the description. But a four-act play of what? It seems it is the significant events leading to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, the restoration of the gospel in preparation for his second coming. That would be a long title for a play. (laughs) Okay, but let's watch for how God teaches Nephi about the restoration. So we just completed the first act in chapter 11, and that answered many questions that Nephi had about the vision of his father. More will be answered in the next chapter, and then we can summarize and talk about what we've discovered. So let's go on to 1 Nephi chapter 12. This chapter is a continuation of Nephi's vision. In it, the angels showed Nephi how the symbols of the vision of the tree of life would apply to his posterity. He was shown that some of his descendants would receive all the blessings of the atonement of Jesus Christ. However, Nephi also saw that his descendants would eventually be destroyed by his brother's posterity, known as the Lamanites. Let's examine what is revealed to Nephi that would help us understand Lehi's vision. Starting with verse 16. And the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, the fountain of filthy water which thy father saw, yea, even the river of which he spake, and the depths thereof are the depths of hell. And the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil, which blindeth the eyes, and hardeneth the hearts of the children of men, and leadeth them away into broad roads, that they perish and are lost. And the large and spacious building which thy father saw is vain imaginations, and the pride of the children of men, and a great and a terrible gulf divideth them. Yea, even the word of the justice of the eternal God and the Messiah, who is the Lamb of God, of whom the Holy Ghost beareth record, from the beginning of the world until this time, and from this time henceforth and forever. Now what follows is a description of the final wars of the Nephites, losing all the light that they had been given. This must have been a heavy burden for Nephi to bear. After all the joy of the mission of Christ that he saw in chapter 11, now to see the great nation that would come from Nephi and his family to end in ruin a thousand years in the future. But let's summarize what we've learned about the vision. A great summary resource is the Book of Mormon Student Institute Manual. Go to Gospel Library, Books and Lessons, Institute, and choose the Book of Mormon Student Manual. It's organized by scripture blocks, so if you go to the one that covers these chapters, you will see a very helpful chart. Let's diagram it out in this illustration. The white tree and the white fruit is the love of God, which he showed by giving his Son to be our Savior. The rod of iron is the word of God, which leads to the tree of life. The river of filthy water the depths of hell into which the wicked fall, the mist of darkness, the temptations of the devil, which blind the people so they lose their way and cannot find the tree, and the great and spacious building in the air, the pride and vain imaginations of the world. Now when you read the chapter, notice the mist of darkness is first seen by Nephi as a literal darkness that covers the land of promise. This is in verse 4. That is contrasted with a whiteness, mentioned in verses 10 and 11, surrounding the coming of the Savior. Think of that in the vision. The mist of darkness and the darkness covering the land before the Savior comes to the Book of Mormon people. Then the whiteness of the Savior and his purifying power for his people, reminiscent of the white tree and fruit in the vision. So Nephi is seeing a literal fulfillment to understand the symbolism in his father's dream. It's interesting that the interpretation of these last three, river of filthy water, mist of darkness, and great and spacious building, are all being shown to him to help Nephi understand the literal apostasy that will lead to the final destruction of his people in their war against their brethren, the Lamanites. Well, and let's look at the various people described in Lehi's dream and see if we find a parallel in Nephi's vision. First, Lehi's dream. 
We've got people who start on the path to the tree, but are lost in the mist. We have people who make it to the tree and taste the fruit by holding on to the rod, but fall away when they are mocked. And we have people who desire the great and spacious building more than the tree. And now Nephi's vision. We see multitudes who heard Jesus but cast him out. People who crucified Jesus even after he healed the sick and cast out devils. Multitudes who gathered together in a large and spacious building to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Nephites and Lamanites who were gathered together to battle and were slaughtered in war. Nephites who, because of pride, were destroyed by the Lamanites and dwindled in unbelief. But what about these people? These are people who held on to the rod and partook of the fruit, and they ignored the mockers and did not fall away. Nephi would later see them as those who partake of the greatest of all of God's gifts, eternal life. Nice. And let's clarify something important. This is not a vision about those that are members of Christ's church and those who are not. You'll find, as we study the Book of Mormon this year, that this is an account of warnings to the members of the church. Time and time again, when the church fails in the Book of Mormon, it is because of the members' wickedness, not the unbelievers. Nephi saw that those mocking and persecuting in the great and spacious building were God's people. Behold, the house of Israel hath gathered together to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The pride of the members of the church will lead to great calamity. Stay tuned. And that brings us to 1 Nephi chapter 13. Let's start in verse 1. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, saying, Look, and I looked, and beheld many nations and kingdoms. And the angel said unto me, What beholdest thou? And I said, I behold many nations and kingdoms. And he said unto me, These are the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles. Now the seminary manual says that Gentiles, as used in these verses, refers to people who are not from or do not live in the land of Judah. Right. Going on with verse 4. And it came to pass that I saw among the nations of the Gentiles the formation of a great church. Skipping to verse 6, And it came to pass that I beheld this great and abominable church, and I saw the devil, that he was the founder of it. Here we see with Nephi the formation of the great and abominable church founded by the devil. And what is its purpose? What does this church desire and seek to accomplish? Let's pick it up in verse 5. And the angel said unto me, Behold the formation of a church which is most abominable above all other churches, which slayeth the saints of God, yea, and tortureth them, and bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. Skipping to verse 7. And I also saw gold, and silver, and silks, and scarlets, and fine twined linen, and all manner of precious clothing, And I saw many harlots, and the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold the gold and the silver and the silks and the scarlets and the fine twined linen and the precious clothing and the harlots are the desires of this great and abominable church. And also for the praise of the world do they destroy the saints of God and bring them down into captivity. The Institute Manual includes this quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. This is from his book, Mormon Doctrine. He says, quote, The titles Church of the Devil and Great and Abominable Church are used to identify all organizations of whatever name or nature, whether political, philosophical, educational, economic, social, fraternal, civic, or religious, which are designed to take men on a course that leads away from God and his laws, and thus from salvation in the kingdom of God. To be clear, The phrase great and abominable church does not refer to a particular denomination or church. We might define it this way. The great and abominable church represents all organizations that are designed to lead people away from God and his laws. The Institute Manual includes this quote from the prophet Joseph Smith. This is recorded in the History of the Church, Volume 6. He says, quote, In relation to the kingdom of God, 
the devil always sets up his kingdom at the very same time in opposition to God. Close quote. Now, in verses 10 through 19, we read Nephi's words describing his vision of individuals who would go forth out of captivity or religious persecution from the nations of Europe and settle in North America, where they would be delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations, as it mentions in verse 19. Latter-day prophets have taught that these individuals were inspired to help prepare and establish a nation with religious freedom, the United States of America, in which the gospel could be restored. Verse 12 is particularly interesting. And I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles, who was separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God that it came down and wrought upon the man. And he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren who were in the promised land. The Institute Manual includes this quote from Ezra Taft Benson. This is from his book, The Teachings of Ezra Taft Benson. He says, quote, God inspired a man among the Gentiles, who by the Spirit of God was led to rediscover the land of America and bring this rich new land to the attention of the people in Europe. That man, of course, was Christopher Columbus, who testified that he was inspired in what he did. Our Lord, said Columbus, unlocked my mind, sent me upon the sea, and gave me fire for the deed. Those who heard of my enterprise called it foolish, mocked me, and laughed. But who can doubt but that the Holy Ghost inspired me? Close quote. Who indeed. Let's go on with verse 20. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land, and I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. And the angel said unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I said unto him, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew, and I, Nephi, beheld it. And he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is a record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord which he hath made unto the house of Israel. Wherefore they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. If it was not already obvious, Nephi is seeing a book that is so precious to us, the Bible. Right. Going on with verse 24. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, Thou hast beheld that the book proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew. And when it proceeded forth from the mouth of a Jew, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord, of whom the twelve apostles bear record. And they bear record according to the truth which is in the Lamb of God. Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles, according to the truth which is in God. And after they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, from the Jews unto the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church, which is most abominable above all other churches. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious." And also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. And all this have they done that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore thou seest, after the book hath gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church, that there are many plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. Notice the purpose for taking away what they have. Verse 27 tells us that it was to pervert the right ways of the Lord and blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the people. Much has been written by modern scholars on the corruption of Scripture in the earliest days of the Christian church, but perhaps you might be interested in some voices who were part of the early Christian movement. Let's start with Tertullian. He would have said this around A.D. 200. He notes that a Christian sect of his day, quote, does not receive certain scriptures, and whichever of them it does receive, it perverts by means of additions and diminutions for the accomplishment of its own purpose. And such as it does receive, it receives not in their entirety, but even when it does receive any up to a certain point as entire, it nevertheless perverts even these by the contrivance of diverse interpretations. Close quote. 
And how about this from Hegesippus? This would be around 30 years earlier, about 170 AD. Quote, Those who attempted to corrupt the healthful rule of the Savior's preaching lurked in obscure darkness. But when the sacred band of the apostles and the generation of those to whom it had been vouchsafed to hear with their own ears the divine wisdom had reached the several ends of their lives, then the federation of godless error took its beginning through the deceit of false teachers who, seeing that none of the apostles still remained, barefacedly tried against the preaching of the truth the counterproclamation of knowledge falsely so called. End quote. Those are some harsh accusations. If you're interested in more modern scholarship on this topic, Dr. John Gee has a great presentation for the 1999 Fair Conference called The Corruption of Scripture in the Second Century. We'll put a link in the description. And we encourage you to look into that. Sometimes members of the church assume that the time of the Athanasian or Nicene creeds were the period in which truths were taken away from the Bible. But this research shows that this was happening a lot earlier. Let's go on with 1 Nephi 13, verse 29. And after these plain and precious things were taken away, it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles. And after it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters which thou hast seen with the Gentiles which have gone forth out of captivity, thou seest, because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain unto the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God, Because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb, an exceedingly great many do stumble, yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. But we shouldn't miss the fact that even with Satan's effort to sabotage the prophecies and teachings, so much has been preserved. Think of all that we've studied over the last two years in Come, Follow Me. The truths that have been preserved are so powerful that they changed the world and brought so many to Jesus Christ. The Bible truly is the Word of God. Elder Ballard characterized the Bible as the bedrock of all Christianity and one of the pillars of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Furthermore, he described the Bible as a miracle, quote, It is a miracle that the Bible's 4,000 years of sacred and secular history were recorded and preserved by the prophets, apostles, and inspired churchmen. It is a miracle that the Bible literally contains within its pages the converting, healing spirit of Christ, which has turned men's hearts for centuries, leading them to pray, to choose right paths, and to search to find their Savior. Close quote. This is quoted from the April 2007 General Conference. For Satan to have done all that work to weaken the Bible, and yet it is still so powerful, is a reminder of just who is in charge of this work. And this is not all. God was not done in his preparations for a marvelous work and a wonder. Let's take a look at verse 32. Neither will the Lord suffer that the Gentiles shall forever remain in that awful state of blindness. Skipping to verse 34. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord spake unto me, saying, Behold, saith the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of whom I speak is the seed of thy father, wherefore after I have visited them in judgment, and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, and after the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by that abominable church, which is the mother of harlots, saith the Lamb. I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious, saith the Lamb. For behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, that they shall write many things which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious, and after thy seed shall be destroyed and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brethren. Behold, these things shall be hid up to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. 
And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock and my salvation. Well, now we have a prophecy of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. So we had the Bible, the Book of Mormon, but this is not all. Let's take a look in verse 39. And after it had come forth unto them, I beheld other books, which came forth by the power of the Lamb, from the Gentiles unto them, unto the convincing of the Gentiles, and the remnant of the seed of my brethren, and also the Jews who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. Today we have the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. And what will these scriptures do to undo the damage wrought by that great and abominable church? Looking on in verse 40, And the angel spake unto me, saying, These last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him, or they cannot be saved. And they must come according to the words which shall be established by the mouth of the Lamb. And the words of the Lamb shall be made known in the records of thy seed, as well as in the records of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Wherefore they both shall be established in one, for there is one God, and one shepherd over all the earth. So this is an important point to consider. There are some who mistakenly believe that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as they have the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, that these scriptures replace or supersede the Bible. Not true. What the angel is explaining here is that the Book of Mormon and other Latter-day scriptures restore plain and precious truths that help us know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that we must come unto him to be saved. But these books strengthen and enrich the message of the Bible. The Bible testifies of the Book of Mormon, and the Book of Mormon testifies of the Bible. All together in one, the words of God. For example, The Bible testifies that Jesus Christ suffered and died for our sins, but the Book of Mormon provides a fuller description of what the Savior experienced as part of his atonement. Alma chapter 7 verses 11 through 13 teach us that Jesus Christ not only suffered for our sins and willingly died for us, but he also suffered our pains, afflictions, temptations, and sicknesses, that he may know how to succor or help his people according to their infirmities. Here's a further sampling of important gospel teachings talked about in the Bible, but expanded and clarified in Latter-day Scriptures. These might be great to explore as you study in this section. I'll post on a slide here the example of the Godhead, the atonement of Jesus Christ, premortal life, the sacrament, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will keep looking for what we learn of Christ and the plan of salvation as we go along. But for now, did you notice a purpose to the vision so far in building up to the restoration of the gospel? First, we learn of the ministry of Jesus Christ and his atonement, chapter 11. Then, the rise and downfall of Nephi's people, but the preservation of their sacred writings, chapter 12. Then, the rise of the Gentile nations, the Bible and bringing it to America so that the restoration of the gospel can happen and the Book of Mormon can be brought forth. But with all these amazing and glorious events, we all have some important choices to make. The Gentiles can choose to follow what God has revealed and receive the blessings. For what God revealed about that, let's look in 1 Nephi chapter 14. Starting in verse 1, And it shall come to pass that if the Gentiles shall hearken unto the Lamb of God in that day, that he shall manifest himself unto them in word and also in power, in very deed, unto the taking away of their stumbling blocks, and harden not their hearts against the Lamb of God, they shall be numbered among the seed of thy father. Yea, they shall be numbered among the house of Israel, and they shall be a blessed people upon the promised land for ever. They shall be no more brought down into captivity, and the house of Israel shall no more be confounded. 
Or, let's take a look at verse 6. Therefore, woe be unto the Gentiles, if it so be, that they harden their hearts against the Lamb of God. For the time cometh, saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and a marvelous work among the children of men, a work which shall be everlasting, either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing of them unto peace and life eternal, or unto the deliverance of them, to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, unto their being brought down into captivity, and also into destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil, of which I have spoken. The Institute Manual gives us this quote from the October 1994 General Conference. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland tells us, quote, This church... The great institutional body of Christ is a marvelous work and a wonder, not only because of what it does for the faithful, but also because of what the faithful do for it. Your lives are at the very heart of that marvel. You are evidence of the wonder of it all. End quote. So with the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have real choices. If we repent, and do not harden our hearts against the Lord and his work, then we will receive peace and eternal life. If we do not repent, but harden our hearts against the Lord and his work, we will eventually be brought down into captivity and destruction. So Nephi learns that there are only two choices or two churches. Let's keep going in verse 9. And it came to pass that he said unto me, Look, and behold that great and abominable church, which is the mother of abominations, whose founder is the devil. And he said unto me, Behold, there are save two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God, belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. The 2017 Seminary Manual tells us, From a proclamation issued by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on April 6, 1845, quote, As this work progresses in its onward course, and becomes more and more an object of political and religious interest and excitement, no king, ruler, or subject, no community or individual will stand neutral. All will at length be influenced by one spirit or the other, and will take sides either for or against the kingdom of God. End quote. Well, with such a choice, surely it is obvious which church should have more members. Let's take a look at verse 11. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth, and she sat upon many waters, and she had dominion over all the earth among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few, because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small, because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. Now, verse 13 tells us that the devil's church will gather up multitudes from every nation to fight against the Lamb of God. But look at how this little army of the Lord will be armed. Verse 14, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. And they were armed with righteousness, and with the power of God in great glory. What a description! What does the phrase, armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory, mean to you? Have you felt that before? The seminary manual includes this quote from the October 2021 General Conference from Elder David A. Bednar. Quote, The phrase, armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory, is not simply a nice idea or an example of beautiful scriptural language. 
Rather, these blessings are readily evident in the lives of countless Latter-day Disciples of the Lord. I testify that the covenant people of the Lord today indeed are armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. I have witnessed faith, courage, perspective, persistence, and joy that extended far beyond mortal capacity and that only God could provide. End quote. Wonderful. I've got a quote here from Boyd K. Packer. This is from the April 2010 General Conference. He says, quote, We members of the church are a tiny fraction when compared to the billions of people on earth. But we are who we are, and we know what we know, and we are to go forth and preach the gospel. The Book of Mormon makes it clear that we never will dominate by numbers but we will have the power of the priesthood. We can, and in due time certainly will, influence all of humanity. It will be known who we are and why we are. It might seem hopeless. It is monumentally difficult. But it is not only possible, but certain that we will win the battle against Satan. Close quote. But what happens to the great and abominable church as it wars against the Lamb of God and his covenant people? Verses 3 through 4 in this chapter already introduce the captivity of the devil and reference a great pit of hell. Let's take a look at verse 15. And it came to pass that I beheld that the wrath of God was poured out upon that great and abominable church, insomuch that there were wars and rumors of wars among all the nations and kindreds of the earth. And as there began to be wars and rumors of wars among all the nations which belong to the mother of abominations, the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the mother of harlots, and behold, thou seest all these things. And when the day cometh that the wrath of God is poured out upon the mother of harlots, which is the great and abominable church of all the earth, whose founder is the devil, then at that day the work of the Father shall commence in preparing the way for the fulfilling of his covenants, which he hath made to his people, who are of the house of Israel. So now how are you feeling about this small group of covenant people and what their chances are? For me, I think about what I can do to be a better disciple of Jesus Christ and truer to my covenants, and I also feel like there sure are a lot of others that I would like to make certain are a part of this church of the Lamb of God. Yeah, me too. Now, in verses 18 through 28, the angel showed Nephi a vision of the apostle John and informed Nephi that he would be shown the same things that John would be shown including the end of the world. The angel commanded Nephi not to write the rest of his vision because John was appointed to record the remainder of it. These verses refer at least in part to John's writings in the book of Revelation. So, just imagine, after seeing all this, you also went through the book of Revelation. Nephi is spent. What an amazing vision. And that brings us to 1 Nephi chapter 15. Let's start in verse 1. And it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had been carried away in the Spirit, and seen all these things, I returned to the tent of my father. And it came to pass that I beheld my brethren, and they were disputing one with another concerning the things which my father had spoken unto them. Now considering the experience Nephi just had, how do you think he's feeling about what he encountered with his brothers. Verse 3, For he truly spake many great things unto them, which were hard to be understood, save a man should inquire of the Lord. And they being hard in their hearts, therefore they did not look unto the Lord as they ought. Where are we on that scale? Are there things in our lives that are impossible to be understood unless we inquire of the Lord? Are we looking unto the Lord for understanding as we ought? In verses 4 through 7, Nephi was overcome with grief because of the hard-heartedness of his brethren and because of the destruction of his people that he had seen in his vision. When Nephi regained his strength, he asked his brethren why they were arguing. 
They responded that they could not understand what Lehi taught about the house of Israel and the Gentiles. Then comes the question. Verse 8. And I said unto them, Have ye inquired of the Lord? And they said unto me, We have not, for the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. So, based on their answer, what do you think Nephi's brothers failed to understand? This might be a great thing to discuss as you're reading with family and friends. Well, I hope one thing that's pointed out is that the Savior doesn't compel us to anything. But notice that the brothers assumed that he would. For the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. The Lord hasn't initiated this revelation to us, despite the fact that we didn't ask. Going on in verse 10. Behold, I said unto them, How is it that ye do not keep the commandments of the Lord? How is it that ye will perish because of the hardness of your hearts? Now remember, he just saw that they would perish in about a thousand years. Going on in verse 11. Do ye not remember the things which the Lord hath said? If ye will not harden your hearts and ask me in faith, believing that ye shall receive with diligence in keeping my commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you? In verses 12 through 20, to help resolve the disputations of his brethren, Nephi taught them the meaning of Lehi's prophecy about the natural branches of the olive tree and the Gentiles. He explained that the olive tree represented the house of Israel. Because Lehi's family had left Jerusalem and was separated from the rest of the house of Israel, it was like a branch that had been broken from the olive tree. He further explained that in the latter days, many years after Lehi's descendants would have dwindled in unbelief, the fullness of the gospel would be given to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would then bring the gospel to Lehi's posterity, restoring them to the knowledge of their Redeemer and to the covenant blessings of their fathers. This would be like gathering and grafting their branch back into the olive tree. This restoration would happen not only for Lehi's descendants, but for all the house of Israel. In the remainder of 1 Nephi chapter 15, we read Nephi's answers to the questions his brethren had about Lehi's vision. Nephi used what he learned in his own vision to teach them. Let's take a look at verse 21. And it came to pass that they did speak unto me again, saying, What meaneth this thing which our father saw in a dream? What meaneth the tree which he saw? And I said unto them, It was a representation of the tree of life. And what about the iron rod? Let's keep going in verse 24. And I said unto them, That it was the word of God. And whoso would hearken unto the word of God, and would hold fast unto it, they would never perish. Neither could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness, to lead them away to destruction. Wherefore I, Nephi, did exhort them to give heed unto the word of the Lord. Yea, I did exhort them with all the energies of my soul, and with all the faculty which I possessed, that they would give heed to the word of God, and remember to keep his commandments always in all things. Now think back to Lehi's vision in chapter 8. Remember that the path led to the tree, but when the mist of darkness came, there was no way to follow the path without the rod of iron. It was a protection and support through the challenging path and a sure anchor through the darkness. Now in verses 26 through 36, Nephi told his brethren that the river their father saw in his vision represented an awful hell prepared for the wicked, separating them from God and his people. These verses teach that no unclean thing can enter the presence of God, as it mentions in verse 34. The Institute Manual includes this great quote from Elder Dallin H. Oaks. This comes from his landmark talk in the October 2000 General Conference. He says, quote, Many Bible and modern scriptures speak of a final judgment at which all persons will be rewarded according to their deeds or works or the desires of their hearts. But other scriptures enlarge upon this by referring to our being judged by the condition we have achieved. The prophet Nephi describes the final judgment in terms of what we have become. And if their works have been filthiness, they must needs be filthy. And if they be filthy, it must needs be that they cannot dwell in the kingdom of God. 
Moroni declares, He that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. The same would be true of selfish or disobedient or any other personal attribute inconsistent with the requirements of God. Referring to the state of the wicked in the final judgment, Alma explains that if we are condemned by our words, our works, and our thoughts, we shall not be found spotless, and in this awful state we shall not dare to look up to our God. From such teachings we conclude that the final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgment of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. End quote. So let's wrap up our time together by looking at Lehi's vision from last week, where we get this symbolic image. This is 1 Nephi chapter 8, verse 30. And they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron, until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. And now we see in Nephi's vision, chapter 11, verse 24, And I beheld the Son of God going forth among the children of men, and I saw many fall down at his feet and worship him. I think that's just a great comparison of that imagery. In the same way people fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree, we see people falling down at the feet of Jesus and worshiping him, partaking of his fruit. And let's not forget the four-act structure we talked about earlier in the lesson. Act 1, 1 Nephi 11, Christ's earthly ministry. Act 2, chapter 12, the Nephites and Lamanites in the land of promise and their falling into apostasy. Act 3, chapter 13, the Gentiles and house of Israel in America bringing the Holy Bible and God beginning his restoration of the fullness of his gospel. Act 4, chapter 14, the church of the Lamb of God preparing the world for Christ's second coming. Wow, what a four-act play. Amazing. To add to that sentiment, I'd like to include a short quote found in the Institute Manual. President Gordon B. Hinckley declared the impact of the Restoration in history. Quote, My brethren and sisters, do you realize what we have? Do you recognize our place in the great drama of human history? This is the focal point of all that has gone before. This is the season of restitution. These are the days of restoration. This is the time when men from over the earth come to the mountain of the Lord's house to seek to learn of his ways and to walk in his paths. This is the summation of all the centuries of time since the birth of Christ to this present and wonderful day. End quote. Fantastic. What an amazing vision, both for Nephi and for us. I hope there are some things that you noticed this time, things maybe you haven't seen before, different gems maybe that you've plucked out of these visions. Be sure to share them with family and friends. And with us in the comments below. And by the way, if this is your first time reading through this, what did you think? Well, that's all the time we have for this lesson, but keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.